If you would like to support us yourself, you, you may consider becoming one of our patrons on Patronite. We'll put the link in the description of the stream. Tonight, we are pleased to welcome our speaker, an architect and a visual artist that constantly questions the boundaries and the language of architecture, technology, and culture of responsive and interactive design. Philip Beasley is a professor of architecture at the University of Waterloo and the director of the Living Architecture System Group that is focused on developing innovative technologies and integrative design. They are responsible for installations that incorporate cutting edge materials with advanced learning technologies, creating structures that react and evolve with movements of people who pass through them. Philip Beasley's work reconsiders the relationship between technology, energy and biological processes in architecture, focusing on kinetic responsive environments. By his work, he's raising the question whether we inhabit architecture or does it inhabit an environment of its own creation? To be honest, I'm eager to see what, we has, what he has to share today with us. And now I would like to give the floor to the Dean of the Faculty of Architecture. Hello, everybody. It is my great pleasure to uh, welcome you uh, on this event, uh, which is a part of a series which is called About Architecture. And it's uh, made in a co cooperation between Faculty of Architecture, Warsaw University of Technology, and the Academic Association of our faculty, which actually I represent both of them being a founding member of Academic Association and a Dean of Faculty of Architecture. Uh, we are meeting almost five years now within this lecture series, and it's been a fascinating journey. And this lecture is special also for the reason that we meet for the first time in a virtual way. Uh, we uh, experience changes in our lives due to pandemic time almost for a year. And uh, uh, we all know that we uh, long for uh, meeting uh, ourselves face to face, for talking to a real audience in our real uh, physical lecture hall. But on the other hand, uh, uh, Technology allows us to have our distinguished guest today while um, Philip is in uh, his uh, studio home in Canada and we are here in Warsaw. So it's a uh, late afternoon in Warsaw and it's uh, uh, noon in, in Canada. So these are disadvantages, but also big, uh, uh, chances and advantages of using this technology and let's concentrate on this chance today that we may have our guest in our homes even if he is in a very remote location. I'm also very glad that we can have uh, Philip as a guest today because he touches very vital aspects of today's architecture and to some extent questions its established nature. Uh, these changes which we are witnessing concern also architecture, architects, and users of our created environments. I hope that we will find some points to discuss and a uh, great inspiration from, uh, from you will be talking about. So thank you for being uh, with us and uh, Thank you, organizers, for making it possible. And let's proceed to the lecture. Thanks a lot. Uh, yes, uh, before we start, there's uh, like one more thing. Uh, please feel free to ask any questions in comments below. Uh, Philip will answer them during the Q&A at the end of the presentation. And now, without prolonging, please join me and welcome Mr. Philip Beasley. <laughs> Thank you so much, Alicia and, and Christoph, for those, those very generous and, and welcoming words. 
Um, I'm very, very happy to, to be with you uh, today. Thank you so much for, for inviting me into your community. I'm going to be speaking for about an hour and I hope that, that you, you will have many questions. I would love to discuss this material with you because I realize that it may, raises many questions and also many problems. Um, and as colleagues together, we can find how crucial architecture can be and what kind of contributions it might make for our de deeply transforming and insecure world. Let me just shift um, and I'll get the, 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 the screen going. Please forgive me just for a second. So I believe I just need to share my screen now. And you'll see a messy screen for a second. And then my whole slideshow. And then I think we can begin here. There. So colleagues, I'm going to call this talk one of near living systems notes towards a kind of a design method. And I hope this is a contribution to, to making and, and, and designing directly. This is the kind of work that I and my colleagues have been doing, a kind of deeply saturated wilderness interwoven with very explicit architecture as well. I hope you can see the column field and the canopy and the ground and, and the sense of, of deep involvement in, in these spaces. And this is the community that I'm part of. Multiple different clusters constantly collaborating within the Living Architecture Systems Group, a group with many different kinds of colleagues in it, but centered on making the architecture of making, of telling, of searching, and perhaps working on a new conception of architecture, the conception that architecture could move into being a living system, taking the ideas from life, using the methods from living systems, and perhaps allowing architecture to be in its own right, a viable living system. This kind of idea is full of problems and it raises questions about method, of definition, of implication, of morals, of ethics. It takes a lot of work. And so perhaps we could say certainly we need new technologies to understand how to make complex architecture. We also need new aesthetic language to be able to speak precisely about the deeply interwoven overwhelmingly complex and sensitive qualities that go into a living system. And we need empathy. Empathy in the sense of being able to feel and navigate and hear and respond. Some of the work that we've been doing is quite optimistic. This is an image from 10 years ago of the Venice Biennale for Architecture in which you can see the layered kind of symphony of multiple parts that weave together into a whole comprehensive, very happy, very joyful kind of landscape. More recently, some of the work has been curling back on itself and making unapologetic nests and sanctuaries, strong kinds of shelters. This is a recent environment from this past year, which is just opening now, in which shells interweave with other areas that are rivers and canopies, a rather comprehensive kind of prototype architecture, which is in the middle of being born. That is to say, it often takes shelters inside other shelters. For example, this is mounted within an, an enormous industrial hall that 200 years ago was used for textile industry. But I think that increasingly this work is resilient and tenacious and effective enough to qualify for full-scale building as well. And so I hope that you can take this talk as being a sharing which moves from very intimate, gentle, fragile things 
into things that can be tough and that can work and that are resilient. Here you can see just some of, some of the most recent ingredients of the meander canopy and nest system, which works with, the, with our most, most recent work. So my talk is going to be organized in seven parts. I'm gonna talk about some rather emotional feelings of being in the world. And I'll use that to try to talk about some very old and some very new craft. I'll invoke some physics, some new physics that talk about how heat shifts and how entropy can form. And I'll use that to justify the idea that architecture can be living. And then I'm gonna share some projects that show how those are applied in, in very practical ways, ranging from buildings to intimate vestment and couture as well. Wearing second skins, bubbling out, seeing a kind of continuum from our own bodies to the world and back again. I'll mention very briefly a historical precedent of Buckminster Fuller, just to acknowledge that this work occupies work in a, in a long tradition. And I'll try to end with a very brief comment on some paradigms in which open things, because this talk is an argument for being open, can be resolved with closed things, the need to have walls, the need to have separation. And the question of how these things might work together and be resolved is perhaps one that underlies this entire talk. There are some fundamental questions then that I want to ask. I ask them myself, perhaps you ask them too. How can we live together? Do we need the kind of tremendously tight boundaries that seal off nations, that divide us, that protect us? Is it possible today to speak of a kind of an unapologetic fragility and openness? Is that possible in a time of deep strain like we find ourselves right now? Is it necessary? What kind of thresholds might result if we, without fear, worked with open systems, finding them as viable, fundamentally refreshing for life? The world that I come from, perhaps like you, imagines first that the ground is solid. So much of my own architecture of ed education was founded on the idea of the solid ground, of the fundament. In Canada, this translates into a history in the colony of tremendous kind of fertility of the, of, of the, the woods, of the flora and the fauna, of harvesting, of nature as giving continually. And somehow the act of colonizing that world to be as powerful as possible in gathering in the resources, in making clearings against the wilderness was a kind of a, a beautiful project for a little while, for some peoples at least. And yet, is it possible to think in these terms as if nature will always be with us, as if the planet is alive? It's not possible to think this way anymore. What of the ground that we stand on today? How is it possible to think of the surface of the earth and the contribution of architecture when the surface of the earth is trembling and so unspeakably insecure? A response can certainly be one to close things down, to move to a kind of a a no trace camping in which we use as little resource as possible, in which we harvest energy and make it as careful, careful as possible and to narrow down our boundaries and to cut off all of the waste and all of the exchange and, and all of the vulnerability that flows out to others to concentrate on making walls. This is even a source of beauty, not just a source of protection. The sense since in Western, Western history, the, the, the Greek paradigms of making something as optimally pure as possible 
drawing spheres and shells around us as a kind of a, a beautiful clarity has a fundamental kind of place in the canon of architecture itself as a source of beauty. And perhaps we can translate this into some lovely inspiring examples, such as the favor, famous drawing of the Vitruvian man in, West, in Western culture in which a Around the strangely various forms of nature rest the pure, eternal, transcendental forms of a sphere, of a cube, of pure, pure geometry, as if somehow an almost divine balance, minimalism, of lovely elegance lies in those things. Why, however, do we think that that kind of reduction to the minimum, to the purity, is somehow better than the multiple branches of a snowflake or the many, many reticulated arms of an octopus or the radiating qualities of a, of a flower petal. It seems to me that in the Western canon of architecture, and in the love of reductive geometry, we are missing a profound number of qualities in what makes architecture viable today. And so I would like to make a proposal that instead of the pure, pure reduction that makes, say, a drop of water, that we also value the many, many tiny arms of the snowflake which mean that I'm arguing also for a kind of vulnerability and a kind of reticulation in which maximum reaction face is possible rather than the minimum reaction face of ballistics or of a drop of rain or of a fort. And so what I'm going to be trying to argue and just justify in this talk is a kind of a space in which we share and are extended out and in which some things certainly coalesce, but other things are devoted to thresholds, to being open and to being among a multiple kind of, land, of landscape that's continually exchanging. And this is a meditation then also on the possibility of a new kind of expanded nationhood, of open boundaries which are curious about difference, which welcome inclusion, which find it as something funny and ironic and somehow lovely when differences emerge that create some turbulence amid the enormous coherence that's possible in the surface of the world within architecture. So this is a meditation on how we can live together in the spirit of curious inclusion and I realize that this is a tremendously optimistic and perhaps naive talk in the time of COVID and in the time of such political turbulence as we see all around us. So I'd love to debate this with you to see if it's viable. I'm going to try to very quickly move through a series of projects so you can see how I and my colleagues have been working with those kind of ideas. Early work started with veils reached over, reaching over the landscape like this twig blanket that set a geodesic, a geotextile blanket over, over a, a storm stream, stream, uh, coast in the, in the North Atlantic. I hope you can see the kind of built billowing geotextile veil shelter that was, was made here. More recent work has used digital fabrication rather carefully working each element, stretching, in it, stretching it into different kinds of clouds and veils and making columns feel, column fields, a rather open, intensely worked architecture. An architecture for participation and exchange. The basis of this new strain of architecture, which has been developing over this last 20 years or so, is that of touch and intimacy in which Small elements, sheet materials, flex flexible works are rather carefully drawn and cut and then worked into very resilient components that build up and then make chains and vessels and components which then interlink 
and then which make canopies and then which are, are woven together into very robust columns and, and, and surfaces and filters as well. In other words, the primary elements of architecture. I hope you can see the kind of rather deeply involving fabric that this architecture makes. And I hope you can also see that it's made of a number of different materials, both sheet goods and, and woven, very robust, robust co column fields, and also some elements that unapologetically grasp and poke and gather materials for their own right. Because invested in this architecture is a kind of an agenda in which the material itself is hungry to harvest material that you generate, as well as serve you and stroke you and entertain you and, and work with conversations. So the sense of architecture is a kind of a hungry soil, as well as a very gentle blanket and field and nourishing place is one that has a, a, a tremendously extended range in this work. Some of the work is automated with very gent gentle machinic motions. You can see the kind of swallowing motion imb embedded in the air muscles within this column and the kind of whisker field making a mechanical ha halo on the outside. And this results then when we weave these multiple components together into an architecture that's very much similar to the experience of walking through a forest or perhaps swimming under underwater in a, in a seaweed forest in which the different elements are charged with motion. There are sensors attached to each one and they pass signals from part to part to part. And we can move through it in a sense of tremendous kind of exchange, exploring with other people, learning, looking at it, looking at the sentience and the machine intelligence, which is embedded throughout its, 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 its organization, observing how we are inside an enormous kind of body in which there are many, many centers of neural anatomy interconnected, but all of which make generous large fields acting very much like ordinary architecture in which a canopy or a column field or a structure create a kind of a ground. Quick examples and then I'll try to try, try to go uh, go through th some things a bit more slowly are this gathering chamber epiphyte chamber in Seoul, where you can see perhaps some of the layers of the systems of building this architecture. You can see a little bit of blue, which is a ser series of vinegar batteries or organic power, which emitted tiny pulses from, from within the sculpture, or the, the layers of the thermally expanded um, but below and some of the mechanisms that, that lie in layers in this great strat stratified field. Here you can see a little bit more detail from, from, from that project. And looking straight up, perhaps you can see some of the hexagonal geometry that make this great interwoven scaffold into which computer cables and individual microprocessors and also vessels of liquid are, are, are worked so that the material can start to work as a kind of a, a, a liquid metabolism exchanging and shifting in very slow, slow, slow time, time scales, as well as the, the, the more ex excited and active time scales of, of, of working with gestures and in conversation. Some of this work also tries to stretch out the boundaries of architecture. And so we often find ourselves making shadow fields in the dark at the far edges of the work in which there are just impressions and glimmers of presence, kind of a, a lovely dream space that architecture can foster as well. And some of the work is increasingly robust and really devoted to, to, uh, to, to high durability, high, high, high strength formations such, such as Noosphere, um, which was erect, erected in, in Toronto just a couple of years ago. Um, or, or a, a couple of other examples of, 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 of these multiple sh shell accretions that I'm, that I'm showing you here. These works typically are made up of very fine grain structures, clusters of glass flasks housed with clusters of 
lightweight skeletal organizations, very often using triangular and hexagonal geometry in addition to quadrilateral ge geometry, which allow things to be cross-linked and very, very durable and, and quite stable. And those kind of granular organizations, as you can see here, are, are, are built up with many, many bundles. You can see little protocells, prototype cells, which are minerals that are working together to, to model very, very simple dynamics akin to, to or, organic nat natural cells, just exploring the possibility that there might be an embedded metabolism with, within this organization. And it, it's based on primary geometries that then work with, with, with ordinary kind of accumulation, working with one crystal and then multiplying it and multiplying it again. And that turns then into a very practical kind of organization in which we translate that abstract virtual geometry into quite robust muscular work of working with materials, stretching it and bundling it together working back and forth with computational modeling as well, such as the, the spherical uh, organizations that you can see in this projection. And then those things are combined with distributed microprocessors and controls and quite a lot of work with, with mechanisms that work with not so much major motion trying to be a major robot or machine, but rather the kind of delicious dynamic that can come from incidents of vibration, of tremors, of touch, of quivering, of tremulous material, working very, very much at the edge of, of human perception and trying to see how tiny, tiny dispositions and oscillations might become quite effective as a kind of language for design. I hope you can, can see that kind of at work in, in this accretion of the whisker fields and then the, the glass vessels that, you, that you'll see just emerging in, in the background here al along with some of the, of the electronics. There we can see some of the protocells just, just emerging in, as, as we pass through this field. I'm going rather quickly and I'll, I'll, I'll go over some of this a bit, a bit more slowly, but I just wanted to give you a feeling for the different disciplines that are involved in this work. And alongside the deeply material organizations that I've just, just described, there's also this, the sense that modular software is directly being, being written and organized together and, and, and programmed. And here you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, the kind of control center, which is a simulation virtual space in which each of the individual nodes devoted to mechanisms and sensors and, and processing and memory are then drawn in parallel with the real world couplings of the machines and the, 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 the physical da data streams that are, that are coming from our own interaction. And so what, what this is, is an organization, a modular organization in which we have a simulation space and a very real space and the two are coupled together. This results then in a rather lovely kind of architecture in which the model and the drawing and the instruction are not something that precedes the action of making architecture. Rather, we're making a persistent model which lives in data space and which is continually updated and which behaves and which the, 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 the real work feeds back into. You can see something of that in the laptop below and the real sculpture ab above the architectural structure. This is at, at Futurium in, 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 in Berlin and it's up right now. So you, you, you can see how <clears throat> actually in the virtual space of, the, of this structure, there are much larger beings that are floating in a large in, environment serving to be exciters, some of which coincide with the, with the space of the structure itself. And they, that is, is, is what's resulting in the reaction of the sculpture. So it's a placement in an expanded set of overlapping influences that, that the, this, this behavior control system is going. And that, that gives something akin to a political system of not so, so much being in a nation which is exclusive, in which we enjoy our privileges within the city walls, 
but rather having the rather delicious sense of being deeply, deeply interwoven with surrounding spheres of influence as well. Seeing them come in, seeing them as benign, playing with them, watching them leave and fostering them. And that's what you can see then. I hope you can see that within the individual patterns of behavior that move through these structures, there are much larger forces, friendly and hostile and invasive for, and disruptive forces by turn that are passing through and that this is participating in. I hope you can get the sense that, that, there, that there, there are those lar larger worlds participating in it. As I go through this rather fast survey, I want to speak a little bit more about craft, just to complete this idea. The individual elements are worked really very carefully, drawing them, trying to tease out their ability to make, say, snap fit for resilient com components, make it, making the kind of compliant skeletons and very, very e efficient materials de 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 uh, derived from sheet, from sheet goods. Those then can be clipped together and made into scaffolds, te textile-like basket works and, and skeletons, which then are assembled together and made into very coherent architectural forms, which then are bundled together and made into column fields, and then that are populated with mechanisms and, and, and with, with the metabolisms of flasks and with the actions of, 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 of making canopies and envelopes as well. You can see a rather careful attention to individual component design here using ordinary orthography, tremendously important design discipline for us alongside rather complex modeling in which we rather carefully draw each component and then make it and make it and make it again, drawing out the ability for something to, to go very, very close to its capacity. We really enjoy watching things fail in the sense we don't want things to fail, but we want to understand how things can be at their limit so that we can leave aside unnecessary materials and also so that things can become much, much more reactive and responsive when they are not encumbered with the, with the sense of, of, of extra stability. This then is organized into a kind of a, a quasi-periodic table, uh, a component library in which individual elements are studied and organized so that then they become a kit of parts so that we can build like, like a kind of a building store or a pattern library, the architecture out of, out of multiple rec rec recurring elements. Here you can see the hexagonal field with the, with the, with the, the, with the, with the jointing systems that set the basis of this. And this makes one of the crafts that we use that of tessellation and, and of, of fabric making in which cellular textiles make tremendously resilient and, and very, very fresh quilts. Some of those are non-repeating. They're quasi-periodic rather than periodic. If we say periodic is, is ordinary repeating, like let's say a brick wall in, in, in which we have a running bond, it might be an A, B, A, B organization, but it's a stable periodic series. The hope of making something deliberately various in order to be able to handle the multitude of vectors that it might encounter creating resilience with it within the, the, the environment is one that can be readily accessed by using prime numbers and by, by using non-repeating, we can say quasi-periodic, in, in other words, the, the undulating kind of st stuttering qu qu quality um, and, and, and building with those qualities uh, in, instead. And you can see the, the kind of colonization of, of of overall systems that can result from that. Not, not at all resisting ordered uh, centers, really enjoying them as, as points of concentration, but also have, having, them, having the means to, to keep things open and, grow, and growing and, and, and drifting. As I continue this very fast survey, and I hope it's okay if I keep skipping through these different topics, it's because I'm, I'm trying to describe a survey of an interdisciplinary practice. I also want to talk a little bit more about the chemical metabolisms which rest, rest in some of these works. This, this is a diagram in which you can see a filtering layer at the bottom 
and then another weed-like layer above that, and then a canopy layer above that. And you can see some protocells, prototype cells, woven into the, the, the centers at, along the bottom. Just to look at those a little bit more, here's an example of, of one where there's a nest-like flask surrounded by, by, by these kinetic fronds, which cool the material as it lights up and, and fluxes. A little bit more deep, more detail on, on, on that. And that's what's inside the flask. In this case, this is called a trob cell, which is made of two, two aqueous chemicals, which are grown by osmotic flux. We can just see it grow, growing here in, in this time lapse. This is uh, um, uh, um, a, a couple of chemicals which make a lovely kind of ferret. Uh, ferrous membrane, it's copper sulfate crystal in, in the center and, and potassium ferric cyanide in, in, in the surroundings. And that blooms out and continually makes this kind of walnut-like little, little fissured cell suspended in between a couple of different oils. Now, I've been going rather quickly and I'll continue the survey just by talking a little bit about some primary physics that underlies this work before I just slow down and, and, then, and then show a couple of projects in more depth. One of the principles that the work is founded on is the sense that entropy is a really a very curious kind of quality and the way architecture responds to the reality of entropy and of thermodynamics itself. Thermodynamics meaning the way heat flows in our world, the, 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 the fact that we get colder, that, that we need to keep ourselves warm, that there's a fundament of, of survival embedded in human psyche and therefore in architecture. If we think about that, if we think about the need to hold ourselves together and keep warm, then we think, can think of some classical paradigms in which we think that the world in some traditions starts with order and then it falls apart. Shakespeare says that in the Western tradition, in the, in the, the British writer, saying that our destiny is dust. Some classical physics says as oh well, says that it's well, that if you have something later on, it will fall apart. This is such a classical thing the sense that our destiny is disorder and decay. And yet, in this past century, some very interesting new observations em emerged. And I'm quoting Ilya Prigogine, the great chemist and physicist from, from the, the 1950s and 60s, who won the Nobel Prize in the 1970s for observing that the world is, in fact, full of dissipative forms. The clouds that rest in the sky, the dunes at the, in, in, in the desert, the constant sense. Okay. Um, so I, I, I do apologize, and I, I, ho I hope this will work again. Um, and please, please just break in um, uh, and, and come, come on screen, colleagues, to, to gesture to me if, if, that, if that happens. Um, so I was just speaking about a physicist who observed that all around us, things do not decay, but rather they last. The constant tide, the, con the constant rolling waves of, of, of the dunes, the way clouds continually arise and continually refresh themselves. And living systems actually exemplify this, the sense that they actually are standing waves that continually live and refresh and renew themselves. And this suggests then that a rather different way of understanding physics is needed. The idea that there is really nothing to fear because living systems do build the sense that we do not fall apart. This is in fact a rather old conception. Rather than some classical ideas 
which say that we must hold ourselves together and make ourselves pure and make boundaries and that that is our, our, our mission in life. There are some other philosophers, at least in, in the Western tradition, that have spoken, sp spoken for 2000 years about swerving, about making the smallest gestures, how atoms can arise and how the tiniest little quavers and, and fluctuations can be full of refreshment. There's a mathematics that can be associated with this kind of, of a pursuit as well. For example, the mathematics of the tangent, the angle of minimum derivation, which is infinitely small, infinitely, infinitely small as a vector comes into an arc. It's perhaps the kind of mathematics and the kind of physics that could be associated with curiosity or perhaps with love or perhaps with getting an idea and so in our work, this cluster of ideas, and I hope you're with me with this, it, it's, it, 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 we're, we're trying, trying to build some, some language which, which is fresh, can be associated with the very deliberate design for precarity, attempting to make something which is deliberately at the very edge of equilibrium in which materials are drawn out so thinly and so finely that you cannot tell exactly where they will stay because they are so poised and so subject to variation that they are always in motion, designing for maximum reaction rather than maximum stability. I hope you can see that that would result in a very different design paradigm than that taught by say the Roman Vitruvius who talks about firmitas, the idea that things must be as solid and stable as possible. Or the architects that are devoted to walls who want as much territory bounded and as, great, as much clarity as possible. This is in some way a corrective that seeks to make things delicious and playful, that seeks to enjoy the sensation of being dizzy and perhaps it is a tremendously productive quality as well and a responsive quality. I'd love to debate this with you. And so I want to suggest that if we are going to work in a new paradigm and work into, in, a new in a new century, that we need to move beyond the Vitruvian paradigm of firmitas, of permanence, and that we need to learn about precarity, what makes things precarious and that we could perhaps value the potency, the maximum reaction, the capacity for interchange, the capacity for sharing, the capacity for life that goes into a term like potency. So I hope then you can see that there's a craft in some of the component making such as carefully drawing and care carefully working e each element to the very maximum ability of it to span where it just starts to tremble and where it is very deliberately precarious. I'm going to extend this just a little bit more and then, then, then we can look at some projects where you can see these ideas at work by underlying some rather striking new discoveries along with, along with Prigogine. A discussion with some people around CERN has resulted in the sense that there is a state that we can speak of, of transition in between the arising and the ceasing of things. And this little blackboard sketch here, I'll go a little bit closer by a physicist at CERN speaks about a kind of a geometry of transition between matter and antimatter, between something arising and ceasing constantly in oscillations, which is a coherent state of architecture in space, which can be called quantum foam, a space of potential in which instead of trying to make something bounded, we are seeking to create the place in which things can arise and continually refresh themselves. This is a concept that has been told me and perhaps taught me in part 
but I can't possibly pretend to understand it completely. But I'm sharing it with you in the sense that I think it may be one of the keys that leads us to reconceive the fundaments of architecture and space. I say that because when I say the word space, I've been taught to, spa to think of space as empty, the kind of proud existentialist void that my parents told me was reality. I was raised as a rather proud atheist. I was told that religion was an illusion. Somehow it was a good idea to imagine that re religion could be stripped away and that instead there was simply emptiness in the surrounding space as a kind of a beautiful quality. And yet contemporary physics tells us something rather different. Instead of being empty, there is now evidence that space is unspeakably full. The discovery of the Higgs particle at CERN just several years ago now, the fundamental subatomic particle, which is responsible for mass arising as well, tells us that space is literally full of potential. The large Bolshoi simulation that we're looking at now is an image, a sample, taken from all known radio transmissions from the entirety of the universe. And what kind of space would that make? Rather than the kind of homogenous field of all snow where it would just simply be gray or perhaps blinding white light or perhaps dark, I love the sense that the individual tiny bits of data all clustering together make such a wondrous kind of tissue like cellular accretion, which is one that seems to resound so very directly with the, the different scales of our own body. Is it wrong for me to be able to identify with this kind of thing? The sense that space is like a tissue, like presence, it suggests that our, our language is really very limited and that we would be very well to discover new language for speaking about space itself in architecture. Perhaps a word like ether would be more appropriate than empty space. It becomes possible in turn to model this material. And I wanna talk again about the craft of, of doing this kind of work. A term that we have increasingly used in trying to model the kind of space that I've just been speaking of, the space of potential, is the space of a kind of a, a gentle fluxing idol in which things can tip one way or another, open and closed and open and closed and continual cycle, cycling. And that's the kind of space that's possible when great forces are very nearly balanced and nearly, nearly in equilibrium, and yet they are still exchanging and moving. A name for that could be quasi-geostrophic turbulence, trophic meaning turning, geostrophic meaning turning of the earth, quasi-geostrophic, that quasi word again, meaning hiccuping and undulating in a kind of a delicious exchange. Here's a couple of models where we can see that at work. I hope that you can see the individual particles just gently moving back and forth and exchanging. This is so very different than the space of a hurricane or a tsunami. Instead, it's the kind of lovely space that might come at the end of a summer's day if you were looking out over a great pool of water and just seeing breeze scudding this way and that way and this way and that way. It might suggest going slow as well and really teetering at the very edges of transitions. I think within this space also ambivalence becomes a, a beautiful kind of quality rather than a weakness, the sense that you might be inclined to go this way or you might be inclined to go that way. So I hope you can see that through various means, through physics, through analogy, perhaps through some poetics, certainly through some, some material craft that I'm trying to describe an emerging art in which precarity is very deliberately fostered. Okay, so I'm going to go now into some projects, but I, I hope that that underlines
the idea that empty space could be replaced by some new paradigms in which we use terms like ether or pluripotency. Going to the projects, I'll just try to summarize the most basic project of all in which stable architecture is then hung and anointed with unapologetically fragile things trying to foster a new kind of fragility and sharing, very gentle kind of tentative suspended work. And with that kind of craft, it becomes possible to clothe an outer architecture and subject it to the forces of, of the world, to work with geotextiles and outer linings for, 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 for work that are open. And with more craft, this becomes possible as a kind of a geotextile as well, spinning the ground, creating our own fundament, cre creating a sense of, of open threshold foundations, which then can be expanded out again and make a kind of very robust kind of interwoven world in which gentle octaves of air differentials, pressure differentials, energy exchanges also become the kind of very stuff of architecture. And perhaps this means that architecture can become a kind of a permaculture in which the space of potential can be surrounded by a deep, deep immersion within the exchanges of the world. So let me then underline this just by going through a few projects. I'm going to talk about a couple of projects that approach, approach the scales of architecture and I'll will end up with, with, a, with a scale of couture. This is a column field that was organized in Washington as, as, as a chamber at the National Academy using expanded diagrids, diag diagonal grids using very, very thin sheets of stainless steel, la laser cut and then expanded out me mechanically and, and bundled together with, with polymers and then, and then populated with, with mechanical systems. Here, here you can see a little bit, little bit of its of its dynamic, in in which a front field pointing up and a front field point pointing down lines this this canopy. The up the up up upper work has salt. The the lower work has has oil, and therefore there's a an osmotic exchange in in which there's a there's a continual kind of pumping pumping be, between them. Here you can see a kind of a gr grotto like lining underneath the upper canopy as, as well with, with multiple protocell vessels in it. Above it, there's a kind of a frond field which is very, very gentle harvesting the air, encouraging it to, to, to pump below and a highly, highly efficient set of, of, of space dressed elements which, which, re, which reach up. This entire canopy uh, weighed just perhaps a hundred kilos or, or, or so. Um, so we're pretty proud of, of the kind of radically little mat material use that, that, it, that it, it explores. Below, you can see the bristling kind of field of, of individual mi uh, uh, microprocessors and, and multiple mechanisms that are passing impulses part to part to part, tracking your own motion and, and exchanging and, and, and harvesting your, your own reactions. And these are made of individual mechanisms like I was mentioning before that are trying to quiver and vibrate and, 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 and share, share reactions, exchanging in, in a multitude of, of very small increments. The beginnings of a kind of metabolism using fluid manifolds are here as well. This is a rather primitive part of the architecture, but there is, there is a hope that there can be far more chemical exchange that can condition the outer atmosphere and, and work with your own occupation as well. A next project works with a tremendous sense of touch and intimacy. This was a pro this 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 is a, this is actually a twofold project and and one is Sargasso, which is laid in into a very large public public hall in in Toronto. When we made this this rather delicate quilt work, this is one end end of it. The project management was very worried about it because this this sits on top of a subway station in which millions of people pour through. And the subway designers used very traditional methods, including the, the most hard kind of tile 
walls and concrete and robust stainless steel, anticipating the kind of abusive crowds. And yet we offered a very different way of making this, which was deliberately vulnerable, while at the same time it was made of resilient joints and rather tough materials, my, my, mylars and stainless steel and polymer and sheets, but following a fundamental uh, paradigm of force shedding of dissipative forms, like I was talking about with, when I mentioned Prigogine before. And what that means is that if you tug on it, the rest will come along a bit and it will flex and the forces will all dissipate. And what happened was in this enormous public chamber that was exposed to millions of people, there was almost no damage at all that came in part because of the physical assembly, which was compliant. And in part also, I think, because it also evoked a kind of civitas, the sense that people cared for each other and said, oh no, be careful with that. And look, this is how you do it. Learning how to work with and, 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 sh and share. So I was very encouraged by this kind of work. I must say the, 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 the sense that we were not simply being naive in making an open architecture that could really survive. The sense of compliance and of force shedding, of making things that are like compliant textiles as opposed to making things that are vitrified and, and, and hardened is I think something that's, that's quite viable. A third project is the Venice Biennale for Architecture Hylozoic Ground that I was mentioning at the very beginning of the, of the talk. And as I've mentioned, the idea that the individual elements might be empathetic might be subject to touch and intimacy. That's one that was really the building block that then bubbled out and, and, be, and became the main basis of, of this work. If you enter the work at first, the atmosphere is extremely quiet and still, perhaps even ghost-like. But as you move through, you're being tracked by a myriad of individual sensors which pick up your motion and then start to, to respond with gentle caressing motion, billowing out. And then that in turn will result in chains and ripples of conversations that ripple out around you, very much like a, a pebble makes ripples in a pond in which, which, which ripple out. And that turns then into a kind of a cascade of very, very ener energetic responses in which things become very intense in, 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 indeed. Shivering, exchanging sound, exchanging light, exchanging motion. This extended image gives something of a sense of the individual conversations of microprocessors having conversations between each cluster and then passing into, blo into blooming kinds of exchanges, which then create quite a lovely sense, I think. They make me rather happy, I will say that, of not being alone in the world, but rather of sharing a space with the kind of active sentient qualities of the machinic world around you. And this of course raises all kinds of problems does it mean that we are automatons too? Is this a deterministic world? Is there something to be feared or perhaps savored with it? Is it funny or is it somehow a tragedy? I think you can see that it's a rather optimistic work and that it's not based on a fear of those boundaries but rather an intense involvement. The last project I wanna share is an extended one in which some couture work is, is being done with Iris van Herpen. And I think you can see that from the elements that are involved in, in the dresses, that they are conceived very much as a continuum with the kind of vision of architecture that I've been, I've been des describing. Some of the work is based on trying to make very, very carefully reactive fabric that uses the absolute minimum of materials. For example, the diagrid that I was describing earlier here is translated into minimal, minimal fit filaments, all made, in, made by laser cutting, work, working with mylar in this case, and then organized so that by pulling things out, then we get three-dimensional forms and, der and der derivations as well. You can see a couple of, ver of versions of, of, of that, that mesh work within, within this sheath and, 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 and the shorter dress. 
And the way it moves is really something that I, that I take tremendous pleasure in, the kind of stuttering oscillation. Perhaps we could see this as another example of the kind of dissipative form or, or the, 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 the quasi-periodic organ organization that I was describing earlier in which li little waves of, of motion cascade and build up and constantly exchange and, and, and flex and, and, and shed forces. A more recent project was was made out of stainless steel, and and th this this was really thinking of of a kind of a, a local architecture akin to the experience of lying in a bubble bath and just having a, an absolute festival of of, of being being sur surrounded with with these ex expa expanded cells, kind of a confidence in in having an open system all all around us as as we walked. And here, here we can see a kind of an exchange between the dress and, and an active canopy be, be behind it. This is a more, more recent project in which individual layers of, or, of organza and tool were pro pro progressively meshed together. And you can see the kind of motion that, that results in the, in the, in the layering in, the, in this sense of a kind of a, a confidence of sheer involvement of the saturation of space around. This is a rather different kind of paradigm that we're, follow, that we're following rather than the minimalist clarity of making a boundary of cutting against the world. Instead, the intermediate liminal space of delaying and trying to be right at the threshold, right at the edge in which things flux and change and vibrate very, very gently is the kind of pursuit. And I'll you just just a, a little bit of, of work in motion in in progress so that you can get a sense of the kind of, of exchange that, that iris and i in the, in the studio work here we're working with a large bed 3d printer with tool a kind of a stretch stretchy mesh meshwork fabric on it and on it locked into it by printing below and, and above is in, in in this case a, a resilient filament which is built up in in individual tines and and th then which is locked together. This this is actually a recording in, in which I'm talking to Iris and we're and we're, we're we're debating the qualities. You can see that the in individual filaments all all move together with many many plates and make a very very tough kind 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 of draping that's that's tremendously compliant. I'm really really rather excited about this. We haven't used this directly in a, in, a, in a dress yet, and I'm look, looking forward to 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 being able to 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 use this. And I'll just give you a snapshot of, of, of something which is not sit downable at all, um, but which I'm rather hopeful about, in which the kind of expanded meshwork that I've discussed be before is here rendered as a, as a rather hostile kind, kind of, kind of uh, defensive garment in which, in which thousands and thousands of spines will, will br bristle out from our, from our bodies as, as we walk. I'm going to start to wrap up, but I just want to give one little nod to history before I do by acknowledging that the kind of work that I've shared is one which really sits with a continuum <clears throat> with, with many other experimental projects in, the, in this last century. And one that I particularly love is the visionary work of Buckminster Fuller. We're looking at one of the most important projects of Buckminster Fuller, I think, in this, which is that of the geosphere floating over the East River outside uh, the United Nations. So this is, a, this is an image of New York. Perhaps you can see the Empire State Building over on the, on the right. But, but this, this world in, in, the, in the foreground is in fact conceived as an operating panel for spaceship Earth. And here you can see another model of the same thing, Man in His World, the Expo 67 pavilion for, for the United States with, with the Apollo capsules uh, parachutes in, inside it and a monorail um, uh, fly, flying by in, in the foreground, this beautiful, ex extraordinary dome. And here in the center of that dome was the geoscope that I described uh, the idea of the geoscope that I described, described in, in the drawing before. Here's an operating uh, room <laughs> for Spaceship Earth with Damaxian maps 
unfolded out and uh, using inventive geometry, which equalizes the, 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 the placement of resources rather than being colonial and favoring uh, U, the USA or, or Europe. There, there's kind of an equal distribution because the distortions of the world are, 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 are less evident in, the, in this kind of Demaxian or, organization. And then all of the desks and data flows, this, this, this is, uh, very early, early 60s, but it, it's remarkably prescient in, 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 in how it works. Um, and the organization of this dome, of, of the Expo 67 dome, might be something to, to fear if, if, if we think about the organization being tremendously uniform and relentless and somehow soulless, as if the entire world is, is trying to be populated by one transcendental geometry, almost a kind of a quiet fascism, we might say. And yet, if we look closer to it, we can see that there's a remarkable kind of drift and local geometry that allows a reconciliation of the prefabricated systems and the reality of manufacturing this thing together with this rather rigorous cellular tessellation. And I love the sense that, 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 it, that it is a tremendously human act that, that, that makes the, these, these ra rather uh, transcendental forms. Here's one of them, the cell, and you can see the local variations. And this is one of the elements of, of the work which, is called, which, which was originally called a sky break bubble. The entire system, the entire pavilion, the geoscope, uh, this version of the geoscope was called a sky break bubble. So these are little, little rolling umbrellas which come in and out and which close up each cell and make it into a responsive so, so solar shade. These were very, were tottery and they tended to break and they weren't they, they they weren't very successful. But it's I think it's rather important to 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 acknowledge that the the work on on responsive architecture has been going on for, for quite a long time and 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 in, in many locations here here we can see the, those those individual ocu oc oculus active apertures uh, disposed in part ov over the surface of, of the pavilion you can kind of tell that they ran out of time or or, or budget and were able to only only do a, a few of them in in this there's kind of a uh, a backstory about the U.S. Pavilion, where it was a story of disaster as well, but we can still see the the idea, the rather happy idea from from the samples that that, that remain there. Okay, so I hope that that gives you a range, and I'm going to sum up. I've been speaking about one kind of response to tremendously uncertain times by making walls, and this essay has been in some way an essay against reductive boundaries by talking about the kind of reticulation of a snowflake in which we work for maximum exchange and maximum reaction with the, with the environment. I've showed some mechanisms and some very simple kinds of, of, of responsiveness, which are rather gentle. I've spoken about the kind of delicious expansion of vestment, <coughs> of cellular tessellations, of scaffolds. I've tried to speak about the kind of layered architecture that might result from working with tiny fragile increments and building them up. And the kind of ro rather robust kind of deep involvement that can start to accumulate in which we work not only with open forms, but with a continual cycling of open and closed and open and closed, making for a kind of homeostasis. And I've spoken fundamentally about intimacy and touch. This little image of a dew bedecked insect is one that I want to raise as a kind of a, a rather happy exemplar of this work. Perhaps I should think that this is a disaster if I were this little being and I woke up and I found myself with condensed water all over me. Would it threaten me? It would test my boundaries, certainly. And yet, if I notice that each of those little specks of dew which have condensed contain a world which gathers in light and which amplifies like a lens of the whole additional world around it, then if I were this little one, 
I would be surrounded by thousands and thousands of worlds. And perhaps there would be more of the sensation of a delicious kind of bubble bath of being immersed rather than drowning. I hope that you can share my optimism about that. And so I've tried to talk about some new paradigms of rather than empty space, calling space ether, of rather than trying to resist, trying to speak about potency, trying to talk about pluripotency, a term drawn from biology in which stem cells have an infinite number of variations that they can move into. And thinking of that idea as being a kind of an architecture trying to make fertile fields for growth. Fundamentally, this is an essay that stands as a corrective at least against being closed and that argues for being open. And above all, hovering at the edge between open and closed and open and closed and open and closed in the liminal state, in the gate of fundament of architecture as a kind of a lovely kind of quest for what architecture can be. Can I be fundamentally optimistic when I look at the trembling surface of the earth? I can't be optimistic, but I hope that this is a contribution. So I hope that that might, that might work for a discussion. From our audience. And uh, I encourage uh, all of you to uh, to uh, ask uh, uh, Philip additional questions. And uh, meanwhile, um, uh, meanwhile, uh, if uh, um, can you hear us correctly, Philip? I think we are experiencing some technical problems, and uh, Philip will rejoin us in a second. Hello there. I'm so, 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 so sorry. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> Don't worry. Can you uh, hear us correctly, Philip? I, I can indeed. Oh, please forgive me. No problem. So thank you uh, once again uh, for, uh, for a fascinating lecture and a glimpse into into the world you are creating. And uh, as you were speaking, I had this um, idea. Um, um, I had this uh, recollection of um, a saying by Polish architect Jacek Damiński, who says that uh, architecture is about directing of the universe and not setting up trifles in the landscape. And I had this feeling that uh, uh, that's something you would uh, agree on. Well, that's, that sounds like a, a really lovely meditation. I think it's also a provocation because it raises all kinds of questions, doesn't it? What do we do? Do we concentrate on small things? Do we con concentrate on, on large things? Igor, could, could you tell me more ab ab about that, that poet and, or, and, and the, me the meaning of, of, of that saying? Well, that's uh, actually a Polish architect, and uh, and uh, he um, he's famous here for uh, working in the uh, macro scale, and uh, has worked on numerous um, uh, installations uh, incorporating uh, uh, well um, bigger uh, areas and and parts of of the city and numerous. Um, maybe also controversial ideas that uh, that he had had um, and uh, we'll be happy to uh, to provide you with some some examples later on of his work meanwhile what i would like to start with is um, um during the presentation we've uh, had a chance to see a lot of um finished um, projects that you had worked on and uh, my first question would be about the inspirations and um during your journey and um, earlier on education as an architect, what um, provoked you and made you um, interested in, in these types of, um, of spaces, these types of uh, structures? I have a background as a traditional architect um, and uh, was, was very involved in, in making large public buildings. Um, 
coming coming from from perhaps a Canadian tradition of of loving huge slabs of wood and 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 primal rock and and thick things, the the kind of substance of of standing on the solid ground that that makes for such such a fundamentally kind of delicious sense of being in the world, and perhaps this is not something that's only only exists in, in in Canada. In fact, I'm an immigrant. I come come from come from Europe. The 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 the, the sense of firmitas of of loving nature uh, loving nature and architecture which which supports us the fundament is something that i've come from what i what i started to try to do about 30 years ago was to try to earn that substance i became interested in making thin things thick in how you could fold things and shift things and turn the, the modern kind of fascination with thinness and lightness, which is one that greeted me as a child and, and that I grew up with, back into solid things, <laughs> Try, trying to make things as thick as possible and as heavy as possible, at the same time, allowing the efficiency and, and the low cost to prevail. So this became a kind of ambivalence, you know, first enjoying substance, then moving through modernism in, in the world of lightness, and then having a kind of an interchange where I would be ambivalent and I would try to make thin things thick. And that brought me into textiles and started to, to become extremely interested in how tension could be so much more materially efficient than compression. The capacity of something to to take force when you're stretching it is so so much more than if that same force tries to act in compression, and this brought me into the world of textiles and then tensegrity and and in, into the into the whole world of 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 very responsive scaffolds. So it really was kind of a step by step kind of kind of move that then transformed again with digital fabrication and then. The world of controls and microprocessors, and and then with 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 synthetic biology and, and and chemistry as as a series of layers. So each each one is is really the work of of, of a rather modest kind of deliberate craft, which is laid onto the onto, onto the previous one. One thing that uh, I found very interesting was that um, when you were talking about the. Um, uh, installation in uh, Toronto, uh, you've mentioned that um, you um, had been worried that it might be um, fractured in some way be because of its fragility, but uh, uh, it turned out to be the opposite, that uh, because it was so uh, fragile, delicate meticulous, uh, people were, um, well, more aware of it and also taking care of it. And you've mentioned of the uh, Vitruvian triad uh, uh, Firmitas a lot. And uh, would that mean that uh, um, we could argue that Firmitas is maybe not that vital because if we create the opposite, then um, and we cr if we create fragile structures, the users will be more aware of them. More aware of them. Igor, you're asking a, a really interesting and, and, and vexing question, which, which contains some contradictions in it. Let, 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 me, I, let me speak just through a couple of, of steps in that it's such a deliciously interesting question. The, I think that firmitas is a, is a very misplaced quality. I think it is negative in the world, first of all. I mean, you know, I, I, let, let, let me suggest that, that I think that some wall building is even evil um, and and, it's tr and tremendously harmful, but I would be naive to speak this way only because, of course, we also need sanctuaries and we need places where we could be intensely private. So, by arguing against this, it really is an interim step, and and, and it's it would be more helpful probably to talk about cycling, a kind of a homeostasis in in which both solid firmitas and also fragility interweaves back and forth. <clears throat> but let me suggest that one of the paradigms that that Toronto installation used is 
very similar to one that's used in nature. The idea that we should make things if we want them to be durable, if we want to, like, like Vitruvius, achieve firmitas, permanence, that we should use the most hard, inert, closed, vitrified, tough materials using the, the cleanest, most elegant and, and, and simple boundaries, then we are working with one set of classical paradigms. Perhaps an example would be, let's say there's an enormous flood down a river. And so as, as architects and engineers, we build up flood walls that are as armored as possible, that, are, that, that armor the sides of the river and channel it and contain it, build, building the strongest kind of mastery. But we know also that the act of doing that actually polarizes and amplifies the force by allowing it to rebound and, and to channeling it more. So it actually makes the force much, much more intense than it was even in the storm. And that turns something which is already an issue into a kind of a, an extraordinarily polarized problem because force rebounds, force sheds, force, force affects the neighbors, not just, not just in your own quarter, but also in the surrounding world, it goes somewhere. And so the example of nature would be to use uh, a wetland, let's say maybe floating multiple gentle hedges all the way along the, along the river, perhaps seaweeds or, or, or weeds or many, many small plants making tremendous interwoven mats. And that kind of structure, a kind of a wetland structure, a manifold, let's say, a, an interwoven reticulated topology is every bit as effective at dissipating the force of that huge destructive flood as the flood wall. And so it's absurd to say that, that that kind of deeply reticulated dissipative form, the kind of form that let's say a snowflake uses rather than the, rather than the form that a clamshell uses is somehow weak or good only for peacetime when times are good. In fact, it's a, it's a tremendously effective way to, to work with architecture. And so it was that kind of principle that, that made for that hanging canopy in the Toronto subway, because it was very effective at shedding its forces. And some of the materials were tough. I mean, it had to have some, 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 some good durability in it. So it wasn't just fragile, but the combination of that kind of dissipative organization, like many, many tiny distributed textiles, together with a sense of openness and fragility, created a, a, just a wealth of, of other qualities. So yes, in the end, I, I would say, I, 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 I agree that, that it is a kind of an unapologetic fragility that is an, a, an important alternative to the, to the Vitruvian quality of being tough and permanent and making walls. We have a question, uh, a question from our viewers on uh, um, what's the, do your ideas have a historical background? And so um, I understand that, for example, uh, can we trace your ideas uh, historically to, to, um, to what's uh, happened in, in the past or, um, or are your ideas based on other uh, concepts? I think, the, I think the ideas perhaps come from, from at least three different sources. One's, one, one is an anti-classicism and, and uh, an, an, another one would, would be uh, debates that have come since the, 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 the Industrial Revolution in the West and a third would come from, from indigenous people um, and 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 thinking thinking that's that's very different than the Western canon. With within the Western canon itself, the 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 realm of Plato, the idea that that underneath everything is is a pure transcendent kind of sphere or diamond or crystal, and that everything else is a compromise. The world is kind of dirty and disappointing compared to kind of transcendent world of of uh, that, that that Plato speaks about. In, in, in his dialogues is one that has informed so very much 
of, 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 of Western art architecture, I believe. And, and this is a, this work then, the lecture I've given is a kind of an essay that hates Plato. Um, alongside that, I think the, the, the industrial revolution, which might seem like ah, trying to maximize work and try, trying to get as much as possible and, try, and try, trying, to, trying to build cap, uh, capital, was was a time when when entropy was formed. I mean, they, like the the concept of entropy that I, I was speaking about, in which things decay, um, was was invented as a term. The term was coined in in 1865 by by Clausius, and and the, the makers of of steam engines made, made it uh, uh, discovered it perhaps 20 years before that. The the idea that okay, well we we're going to use work, and we want to maximize the work, and so we don't want to lose work, and so entropy is a bad thing because entropy is the thing which you can't convert into work. And yet, right alongside that tradition is romanticism in, in the Industrial Revolution. The, the, the intensely kind of personal sense of what kind of feeling and what kind of presence is coming in this lovely kind of interweaving in which the human psyche and the mechanism are coming together into one kind of thing. And I, th I think that that's, that's a, a tremendously interesting cultural period in which romanticism and the industrial revolution are somehow in constant debate. The, the third source would be the surging, surging kind of understanding that's happening from contemporary physics. Because contemporary physics, since the establishment, the discovery of the Higgs boson now eight, eight years ago, is, is establishing that space is not empty at all, that it's full. That it's that's pluripotent. That we can we can work with with possibility as a, as a, an increasingly tangible kind of medium. And when I'm quoting the 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 old medieval term for space, which is ether, I'm also using Einstein's words. Einstein said said it's talked about space as ether, and it seems like it could be a very useful term today to ra rather than valuing the kind of existentialist idea that, that God is dead and that space is empty. Instead, if space is full, we are never alone and, and we can't throw something into our backyard. We have to deal with it. We have to realize that our actions affect others and that others affect us. And so there's a sense of a kind of a, a lovely kind of ethical involvement, which is really can be very, very encouraging. And so that, that, that's a, a, a current tradition that relates to the other two historical traditions, and all three of them are really, really fueling things. I didn't mention indigenous knowledge directly in what I've just said, and yet somehow the sense of being in, in land here in Canada, which was peopled by others and which I have colonized, gives a sense of, of walking very carefully and, and want, wanting to listen. And, and this, this is a change that it is transforming so many of us and, and which, which I, I simply have to, have to work very hard on um, because almost everything I've been talking about it, it come, come, comes from a Western paradigm instead. A lot of um, your work is based on uh, physics and uh, mathematics. And uh, we have another question on, um, is there a space for uh, humanists in contemporary architecture? And uh, can uh, um, uh, psychology as, as a science take part in the uh, process of architectural designing and development? Boy, I, I, I wish I could have a conversation with, with, with the, the person who's asked that, um, uh, because it would be very interesting to, to hear uh, what attitudes are about, can, about physics, let's say, um, or mathematics. Um, I'm personally an amateur and I'm always intimidated by the complexity of being asked to quantify something. I somehow get angry. I, what, 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 like, I don't know. And when I say that, I mean that really, I really do mean that, you know, in the, in the sense that the idea that we should be clear and certain and rational is an extraordinary projection of values, perhaps bound up in the same kind of Western canon that I was really complaining about just a moment ago when I spoke about, about how I hated Plato. Is it true that 
at the center of the world, there is a diamond or a crystal or a sphere. Is, is that what the universe looks like when, when we zoom far, far, far out, that it looks like a sphere? Or does it look like a snowflake? Or does it look like a hovering, weak, anxious, ambivalent creature? My own experience is one of ambivalence, almost always. And that makes me wonder whether ambivalence is actually something to be embarrassed about. I am embarrassed about it. I'm embarrassed about being uncertain. I'm embarrassed about, about, about how confused I feel. I'm embarrassed about how shallow my knowledge is. I know that I don't know very much. I know that someone else will, 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 know, will know more. And yet perhaps the problem is in the attitude about that word. Because if I think about ambivalence, then I realize, wait a minute, valence means inclination and disposition and ambit means surrounding. And so varying valences, vary, varying uh, dispositions, surely that could actually be a beautiful term, really coincident with curiosity and, and empathy just as much as, uh, as weakness. And so at least perhaps that could say we should be unapologetically weak or, and perhaps even more than that, we could turn that into a sense of ambivalence as being the essential qualifying ethical condition that equips an architect with the right to affect the built environment today. And if, if, if it's possible to approach it this, in this way, then, then I, I, I would hope that we can somehow bring together these two apparently different things in, in, in my friend, the, the questioner, who said that there's physics and, and, and math, but then also humanism and can we have both? Well, what I've tried to do in, in these comments is, is point to how some physics and some mathematics involves a delicious kind of quasi quasi period periodic undulation and, and and spaces of the Klinemann, that minimum angle of derivation, for example, in which is it so infinitely small that it always escapes us and and in those spaces, we go in into quite a lovely world which really has to be populated by intuition and and by emotion. Um, and in which quantification will always be a distortion. It, 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 will, it will actually spoil and, and it will distort the ability to, to surf right at that edge. And so to me, the, those two worlds are one. So maybe in a way, speaking of entropy, um, how did 2020 uh, challenge your process and the development of, of works? <laughs> and uh, also how did it influence your fascinations? And, uh, uh, and the uh, additional question is, what is the paradigm shift then? Uh, are we always going to post-rationalize something terrible that has happened, that has caused unthinkable suffering? And we're trying to make something brave about it. You know, I, 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 I identify with what Christoph said at the beginning that this makes it possible for us to be together in ways that we could, we could, we could not be, not be together. But, but I will, I will acknowledge that it's been a terrible year. It is, it has been a year personally where I've felt the the most despair that I've ever felt in my life, um, and I felt that felt the most lonely and and felt the most frustrated. Uh, I will say that there are some very happy things that have happened as well. Um, one of the things I think that has been happy is that I've found that I've been forced to slow down. And in slowing down, I've discovered that I'm dreaming a lot more. Um, and this makes me think perhaps that there's some very important insight that can be gained from those kinds of speeds and, and the kind of action of everything in the world, the fearsome carbon consumption, the, the fire that has been, been driving the world increasingly, increasingly, increasingly. 
perhaps revealing a different quality. In reading about abiogenesis, the, the mineral origins of life, abiogenesis, a, a, the, wor the word of kind of hovering at the negation of something, biogenesis, biology, li life, the, the beginning of life, genesis. In reading about abiogenesis, I've read that the times in which the sun is shining and things are going fast are actually profoundly negative for the formation of life. That's because things polarize too quickly. They precipitate out, they form shells, they resolve themselves, they burn off, they, they, they resolve into, into knotted, clear forms. The time when life can arise actually depends on the ice ages and on times when things are very, very limited in, en in energy. So things move glacially slow and so the most delicate formations can weave together and arise. In, in a space which is not being driven. And when I use the word quasi-geostrophic turbulence, I'm sorry for that syllable mouthful, but, but it's a, I, I, maybe you can just say it with me in your own priv private space and, and realize that it's a delicious word. I hope you, I hope you can agree. Um, what I mean by that is, is an example in which things very, very gently tip back and forth, ever so slowly. And so it's almost as if we're being encouraged to stay babies and not hurry up and grow and, and, and per, per, perhaps stay asleep and not being encouraged to wake up in the sense that in that space, things can grow, things can emerge and find agency and fi find belief and find an understanding in their own time. And it's not helpful to have the drive pushing. And so that would, that would suggest to me that this, this year could very well, in my optimistic state, be a kind of a transitional space in the sense of a kind of a, a beautiful cauldron of possibility where we can find ourselves again and, and perhaps work with work in a centered way. Um, I, I'm speaking in both ways. Again, I'm ambivalent because it's, I think we have to acknowledge suffering. This is real. This has been some, some of the most terrible things that have happened to some people. And I'm sure we've all, all have versions of those stories and know, knowing the kind of suffering that we've seen in, 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 in people around us. And yet at the same time, perhaps it, it is the most precious time, one of the most precious times ever in, in recent human history. Another question from um, our viewers is uh, on uh, how um, how should young architects uh, who are starting their um, education and their journey um, well how should they um, where should they get uh, inspiration from and uh, what should they um, work on to um, to uh, well hopefully simply to become better, better architects. The work that I've shared here includes deeply, deeply priv privileged technology in which the world's resources are concentrated. While at the same time, it also includes rock and paper and scissors and string and taping things together. It includes quantum physics, and it also includes simply clapping and singing and, 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 and speaking in syllables that might become speech. That spectrum is something that I, that I, I think architecture is uh, very uniquely positioned for. I love the sense that by becoming an architect, by studying architect, I somehow have a a past that allows me to look behind things, to go backstage in a theater, to look underneath the car, to, to, to lift a rock and to see what's underneath it. And some, somehow to be concerned for the passage of one thing to another and back again. What I can say is that I feel that the most important quality is involvement in every part of our bodies. I value my blue collar as much as my white collar 
I wonder if you have that saying too, and you know, implying perhaps two different classes of people. But my my blue collar, the one the one where I work with my hands and I make things, and I and and I labor, has a kind of quality and a satisfaction in it every bit as much as the one in which I manage, or I or 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 I I, I publish or I calculate. And it it seems to me that we could perhaps. Revolve, revolve around a fundamental paradigm shift because that was part of the question. When we realized that even more poignant than a blue collar and a white collar is the location of our brain. In the sense that, yes, this is a brain, but the neural system as a whole is one in which 50% of our neurons live outside our brain all the way through our nervous system, running, running through it through our limbs. And so if we think that where thinking and where understanding and where empathy actually happens is one that we don't understand very well, where consciousness happens, there is increasing evidence that we are not so different than octopi who think with their limbs. And that in fact, the 50% which lies outside this memory chamber, this processing chamber, which is part of certainly of cognition, which lies in my arms and in my nervous system and runs throughout my anatomy is a complete thinking skin. And if, if that's true, that we think with our bodies and our minds, that is literally true, then we could also expand it and say, well, do we think also with the pheromone cloud, which lies outside our bodies? Do we think collectively when we are in a conversation, when we look at the speed of the tiniest glimmer of a twitch of an eyebrow or a glistening of, of, of our eyes, when, when we understand each other and we realize that we are somehow coupled, when we think as a group, as a family or as a neighborhood, when we think of as, as a town or as a city, is it possible to speak about a nation thinking or a world thinking today? I think it's very difficult to talk about nations because we can be aware that how nations have caused suffering as well as possibility. But I do hope that the kind of continuum of those things, which starts with our own sheer involvement might be a kind of a paradigm and openness the, the, the quality of being in between and being ambivalent is perhaps a, a, a fundamental paradigm that, that makes that possible. That was a bit of a long answer, Igor, sorry. I hope that's okay. Uh, we have some more questions from uh, members of our association. So uh, now I'll ask Victoria to, uh, to ask them. I will try to read um, two of the questions we already written. And first is probably about product that's a bit old, uh, but what was your motivation uh, behind the Palatin burial project? Um, oh, was it the moral issue of providing that burial shroud or maybe a technical matter? Because it really interested me behind the like, inspiration. What was your motivation behind it? Oh, thank you so much for raising that that project. Um, for the for the many of you will will not know about it, but but this was a project called Palatine Burial, which which uh, was enacted over the space of a year, nineteen ninety five to ninety six, in Rome, um, while I was given this this really glorious time as as a as a, awarded the Prix de Rome for for Canada, and um, I I. It actually parallels very directly the, some of the remarks I made er, earlier ab about substance in Vitruvius. I went into that project seeking a kind of new materiality in which the underground, the depth of the Palatine Hill at the center of, of, of Rome might, might be something that I, that I would map because there were dispersed archaeological teams working, but no one had had done one compre comprehensive map, map and, and digital section of, of the work. Uh, 
I was going, I was going at it at a time when, when computers were, were not very active and I brought one with me and, and was rather proud of my ability. And so I was going there to, to bring some, some new digital craft and, and gather many records and make one comprehensive first generation digital model. And that was really about the underground, the idea that the underground is the space of the psyche as well. When we talk about the underworld and the un underground, or let's say when we talk about the underground for architects, we almost immediately go into into the underworld and 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 the unconscious as well. And this was a, this was something that really fascinated me. But I was expecting to work with the material of of the Palatine Hill, this glorious layered artificial mountain, which is the center of Rome and the site of original Roma Quadrata. What I didn't expect when I got involved was that I would encounter human sacrifice and building sacrifice as well. I, I, I was taught about the pomerium, the, the sacred cut that encircles the city that makes the boundary. There's another wall. It was the site of the, the, the wall of Rome. And the sacrifices were ones that, that really overtook me. And in particular, I, I, encount, I encountered, I was shown by the archaeologist who dug it up, um, the uh, uh, a place of a sacrifice underneath one of the uh, the first gate, Porta Magonia, one of one of the one of the gates of Guerma Quadrata, and and the evidence of an infant sacrifice that was laid there, in in siftings and treated with tremendous reverence, and I I I, I worked with retracing the mythology of sacrifice and the and and sac and and Roma foundations. And this, this brought me into a very, very curious state of, of meditation in which the horror of that act um, was intermixed with the sense of sheer fertility and, and, and bringing into, into our bodies and, and of, of housing life inside and outside. And this, this kind of meditation was went went into the grotesque and then and then out again in into the world of fertility and and the, it for several months the task became one of recovering and and trying to respond with with the with with material that would be adequate for creating a new surface of earth that 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 would be a fundament that we could stand on because this was this was a a threshold of the city and this was an act of architecture and i wanted to make a res publica a place of occupation and so the the crafts of textiles and of of cellular tessellation and of, of spinning of, of uh, an intensely embroidered uh public forum surface um really took took over me and 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 motivated um, the assembly of the digital crafts and the physical crafts of, of making the, these first generation light, lightweight geotextiles and, and, and accretive a hovering textiles. And that the project has really stayed with me since. Um, and perhaps you can see some resonance of it in every single thing I've done since. You're muted, Victoria. Okay, we have time for one last question, Victoria. Okay, so it will be a question about uh, your 17th work for your 17th architecture biennale, uh, about how will we uh, live together, uh, the theme of the 2020 biennale. Uh, it had become more relevant than ever. Russia has already announced that its national pavilion will be online. Um, and I've heard that your new work may take numbers of forms from a condensed version of the approximately uh, 1,020 square feet in Marisid interactive physical installation um, <laughs> to with an expanding audio and or uh, AR VR component to something that lives purely in virtual world. So the question is, how do you envision uh, that purely virtual architecture? Uh, your works are usually all about feeling things and interacting with them. So somehow being part of them me, is very crucial to your work. We fill the space by inter interacting with the work of art. So uh, how do you feel about VR architecture? 
Um, I'm, I'm terrified and fascinated. <laughs> um, what, what I will say is that the, the world of dreaming, which has become so, so present in, in this past year, um, and the very careful craft of, build, of building the simulation space in control software, which is, is, has, been, has been serving machinic memory and, and curiosity algorithms in, in, the, in, the, soft, in the behavioral software, which, which, which my studio has, has been in, investing in, um, mean that there's a constant oscillation between projection and realization and projection and realization. And so the anticipation of what will happen in a simulation space and then the actual result of what happens in, in this concrete world um, around, around us makes for a really lovely conversation. And so uh, it is entirely possible to stay dreaming and to stay in the projection and for that to be very involving for a very long time. Um, so part of me is horrified that, that, it, that it may not be possible to have the, the, the physical part. But I made a statement earlier about the location of our consciousness and the observation that 50% of our neurology lies within our body outside of our cranium. And I think it, 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 we, we, we have only to, to, to move in, into contemporary neuroscience or, or psychology to, to hear advice that says, listen very carefully to what your body says or what, what, what the world says, because it is thinking and the act of, of cognition, of coupling, is such an interesting meditation of where consciousness comes from. Does it come from an isolated figure? Does it come from the surrounding? Or does it come somehow from the conversation between those? And are we actually thinking only when we're at the edge of things? And if that's true, then, and, and if, if half of our neurology lies in our body, then we could perhaps say that the possibility of architecture is thinking and that thinking itself is a material act, not simply uh, kind of an idea like Plato, who I hate, of, of talking about a world of, of transcendence separate from our bodies. Now that means in turn that rather than thinking that we are disappointed by not being able to be there, rather we could realize that the conception of that simulation is material. It is electromagnetic. It is the action of, of, of tangible vibrations within the, the display screen, within the interface, with, with, within the recordings and the algorithmic plays. And it happens at a different scale, but it is in the world already. It never was separate. It is a fundamental part of our reality. And so, this suggests that it does not need to be a loss at all. It is a different home for architecture than these particular other scales. So I will, I'll try to be optimistic in saying that, <laughs> Victoria, that, 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 that the projection and the simulation, which is deeply invested, will be deeply satisfying and embodied. Um, I will also confess my uh, my frustration and my sadness and my impatience and my hope that I can be there and perhaps be with you as well, drinking a lovely glass of beer in the evening together. <laughs> well, I think that's about all time we have for today. So ladies and gentlemen, I would like to once again, thank you, Mr. Beasley for accepting our invitation and giving an extremely interesting lecture. And last but not least, we would like to, to invite oh, oh. we would like to invite you for our next lecture at the beginning of March and wish you a pleasant evening. Good night. Okay. Great. Good night. Thank you so much, colleagues. I really love this. Thank you.